Chad here. So good to have you. Chad Stewart, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. So you, you're just a fascinating thing that you're doing. You are an author and at the top 1% sales level and success level. I'm just fascinated by the books. Why don't you just tell everybody a little bit about them right at the beginning? Yeah, I'll do a quick overview. But originally from Newport Beach, California, I was back east in uh, Wellesley, Massachusetts for about 16 years. Did my undergraduate in British literature and European history which really got me interested in this and actually lived in England off and on for about two years and then went on to postgraduate and graduate school and then actually was <laughs> investment banking and cool. ended up working for three Fortune 100 companies. And it was at one of those investment firms that I was sent to this boring webinar in, in Providence, Rhode Island. I think it was insurance. And I started to drift and I started to doodle and that's when I got this idea for Ritfield Lost Crown. And I really just doodled a circle, three lines, a basket, a boy and a girl, and I wrote the boy in the balloon. And I thought, gosh, that'd be a fun story to write. I kind of saw these two orphans, boy and girl, Tom and Sarah, 12 years old, you know, it takes place in England and and uh, they escape from this orphanage and they find this hot air balloon. And that's kind of how it started. And so I, I went home and started just to outline it at that weekend, you know, one piece of paper. It starts up in Yorkshire, Northern England, at this horrible orphanage called Weatherly Orphanage. And Tom's been an orphan his whole life. He's been at Weatherly for six years, and this is the year he's going to escape. And um, he's not going anywhere without his best friend, Sarah. And then they commandeer this hot air balloon as they're, as they're escaping. And they're relentlessly chased by the illustrious detective Gowerstone, who's renowned for capturing runaway orphans. And so right before Tom is, is leaving and breaking out of Weatherly Orphanage, he's told that his parents might still be alive. And he's given one clue. It's called Britfield, the name Britfield. And so you have this sort of Britfield and the Lost Crown. And that's not the sort of main driver. The main driver is to escape. And then from there, it's to try to get to London. And you know, that's their goal, the greatest city in the world. You're giving you something that's an adventure for kids, but yeah. also is teaching them real things and even relevant issues of the world, but caught up in the adventure story that is going to get them to actually read something. And sure. I know you're, you're against the Harry Potter stuff and you're against these other you know books. You're you're This is wholesome education in adventure, but yes. re in giving relevancy to what's happening in the world, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, I mean, they're fast paced, high octane uh, suspense thrillers, if you will. There's a great comment we, we got, um, I think it was from the um, uh, Epoch Times that said it's a combination of C.S. Lewis and Dan Brown. <laughs> I thought that was pretty <laughs> cool. And we had this woman uh, teacher that, that reviewed the books recently. And she said, she goes, I love the Ritfield series. She goes, reminds me a lot of James Bond but with a bigger cast and a greater purpose. And I thought, what a great comment. So it is, and we could talk a little bit about the writing style too, because that's so important to sort of engage the kids and keep them engaged. And you know, we've, our feedback has been phenomenal. You know, thousands of, of emails, letters from around the world. So we've had global impact. But yeah, we launched in August, 2019. It took me four years, 2,500 hours just to write book one, 384 pages. And then we launched August, 2019. Our youngest readers is seven. Our oldest readers, 93 years old to date, and 55% of our reading audience are adults. And like I've said before, it's what's great about the series is as you're reading and it's exciting, fast-paced. It's always layered. It's based on the three-act structure, and um, it's kind of always building and building and building and building. There's no lull to the story. But as you're reading through, you're learning about geography, art, architecture, culture, and history. How great for your kids, right? Uh, it's based on family, friendship, loyalty, courage, hope, and faith. And if you say, what's the number one theme of these books? I would say family. The importance of family, the meaning of family, and not always by birth or blood, right? It's people that become part of your life that you guys have even a stronger bond and people that would lay down their life for a friend, if you will. No greater love than that, right? This generation yeah. needs to hear these things. It's so good. You know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, on the writing side, how did you develop your writing style to be so engaging and intriguing? Did you just naturally have that? Or no. was, was there strategy behind it? Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because um, I never – it Britfield series found me because this is a this is a multi multi-million dollar – uh, quarter of a century investment on my life. And if you will, those bridges have been burned a while ago. You know, it's that yeah. sort of sense of retreat. And it's just like yeah. you finally burn the bridges and say, yeah. I'm all in. Yeah, and that's, that's right. really a sense of great faith, if you will. You sort of have to. But um, Anything great seems to be that story, doesn't it? It is. And and it's and I talk about this a lot on the on other interviews that I've done is, is that, um, you know, every overnight success takes between one to two decades. And that's very real, very accurate. Anything of quality takes a great deal of time. And yeah. the difference between a hobby and a profession is about eight to 10,000 hard, dedicated 
hours, not just hours, not 10,000 general hours, 10,000 yeah. dedicated hours of working your craft. And again, that's a fact. And so we live in this yeah. flashover substance society where everybody seems to be successful now. It's all fake. Um, they're all these billionaires. They're not billionaires. It's not their money. They're actors that are playing a role. It's all nonsense, you know? And if you go back, even in like in the film industry, you see some successful actor or something and suddenly, you know, they're maybe getting an Oscar or they're getting these great roles. If you go back, I mean, at eight years old, they were going out for commercials and getting nothing, you know what I mean? And a hundred rejections. And then by 12 years old, they got a commercial and then they got a couple bit parts. And most of them have been in the game for 10, 15 years before you even heard their name working it, trying, dedicating, committing. And that's pretty much true to any great success out there. So people here 384 yeah. pages, I, from your experience, it sounds like you probably still didn't waste a word, even though that's a lot of words. It's no, and that's no, I, I've had 12 year olds that have read um, uh, Britfield and Lost Crown in, in five hours. Wow. And I couldn't read it in five hours. And it's not because it's, you know, big font and simple sentences. It's not. It's just the way that it's designed. And to give you an idea is when I'm on my last and 10 percent of it is writing, 90 percent of it is, is rewriting and editing. And so what I do is when I'm, I'm writing my draft, I get my first draft and then I will edit it three or four times on the computer. And this takes weeks, if not months. You know, you start yeah. at the very beginning and you're, com you're combing through it. I always like to say it's like combing matted hair. You're polishing it, polishing it, polishing it. When I get 100% finished on the computer, I start to print it out. And I never print more than two pages because it reads oh. very differently. And I could have the greatest work of art ever in history on the computer. And I start reading it. And I'm like, yikes. You know, that's like that, that, that sentence doesn't even make sense. Or I've used the same word like three times in this paragraph. Well, wait, wait, hang on, hang on. What yeah. is it about having it on paper that makes it so different? It is night and day. It is absolutely night and day. It's just It just reads differently. And um, I, I don't know, I can't really sort of explain it, but it just reads differently. You could have this really great, maybe you're writing um, a memo or you're writing your resume and you have one page just on your computer and you've gone through it a hundred times, print it out and start reading it. And it just reads different. It looks different. You catch things. And, um, and that's really where the, the, the process, that's when I roll up the sleeves. And I literally, I, I literally have a, um, I really, that's why I only print two, two pages at a time, maybe sometimes three. I have, a, I have a highlighter and a pen and I just start reading through it. You know, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'm not like intense. I'm relaxed. I've got the lamp on and I'm just reading through it like a book. And I'm, I don't like that. And I don't like that. And if I mark more than five things within half of it, I stop right there. I go back. I fix it. I print it again and I start again. And that's my process. I'll keep reading it and reading it and reading it until it is absolutely very smooth. I read out loud. I do the dialogue out loud. How does it sound? How does it flow? And so it's this kind of, if you will, brutal <laughs> editing that, it is that brutal. just makes these books just flow. And just to give you an idea on my last edit, it's already as tight as I can get it. My challenge on my last edit of every single book is trying to get rid of one sentence per page. So Whoa. what absolutely doesn't need to be there? Can I combine a couple sentences into one? Can I nip out that last sentence, you know, from a dialogue or something? Does it need to be there? So I love that. We'll shift gears a little bit because yeah. I want to talk about, you know, technology, AI. I want to sure. talk about one world currency. I want to talk about Russia a little bit, some of these different things. But I want to hit first, you said something just a little while back that I thought was super relevant, which is when you printed it out, you could see it, you could read it in a whole different way. And I think that's so true because I think us as humans, actually, we're in a different mode when we're in the physical. When we're looking at a screen and things like that, there, it's something different about us. Yeah. But when we are actually holding something and it's physical, a book or something like that, it's different. That's like reading the Bible. You can sure. read it on your phone, but if you actually open the Bible, I don't know. I think something different is actually happening. Um, yeah. The same words. And I do, too. I, it it irks me a little bit, too. When, when yeah. it's like, okay, so open a passage, so and so, and everyone's grabbing their little, their little phone, and I'm like, really? Like you just, you know, like, <laughs> I don't know, you know, it's just. But and it's interesting too, just on that note, that um, yeah. really the book market is stronger than ever. Um, you know, there was this whole push of the eBooks, you know, and digital, yeah. digital books, digital libraries, and and again, the usual suspects was pushing that because if you can put everything on an ebook then guess what you can change it and you just mentioned it too the bible so i could purchase the new king james bible you know yeah. from this thing as an ebook and then you know 1 a.m in the morning guess what they, they do they remove a line or a word and they mm -hmm. can do that as much as they want and i how do I, I have no recourse versus if i got a physical book good luck with that right um but the ebook market's really flatlined at about five six percent 
So um, they were thinking it was going to be 30%. It's flatlined and it's not going anywhere. People people don't like the eBooks. They're sick of them. There's always a market for the eBook is, is what I'm saying, yeah. but but it's not it's not that big. So the kids love reading the paperback. They love the hard covers. Yeah. The paper market's growing now at five to 10%. Um, wow. uh, independent bookstores, five, seven years ago, there was about 3,000 in the United States. It was down to 16,000. I'm sorry, there was 3,000, it's down to 1,600. It's now growing at five to 7% every year. So wow. independent bookstores are coming back. The book well, I think I think on another back. note yeah. re regarding this too, is that as technology takes over more and more things, this is one example, but as technology takes over more and more things, we are gonna become increasingly starving for what's human, for what's physical, that's a good way to look at it. and for Absolutely. what's real. And I think you're seeing that with books. And this is an older cycle because this happened to books a long time ago. Sure. But now we're seeing this happen in other ways in society and there's things that are coming that we haven't even seen yet, I'm sure. And mm. as these things happen, there's gonna be a cycle. Yeah, it might decrease the physical using that for a while, but then people are going to be starving for it's human again in that yeah, realm. I like and that. I think that's, I think that's it. We want, we want a physical connection with humans. We want real relations. You see that with social media, right? Sure. The loneliest people are the people on social media the most. And it's because they're, they're sacrificing real relationships for time spent scrolling and things like that. And sure. so I think it's just so important that we all recognize that. And we recognize that in our kids and our family, we're modeling, doing things that are real, having real relationships, not wasting our time through technology. I love technology. Uh, sure. We're using it right now to be able to do this. This yeah, is absolutely. incredible. But let, on technology, it's a good segue right into sure. the dangers of artificial intelligence. I'm sure we both agree that there's very many positives about AI, uh, but there's also dangers and it's important for us to recognize that, especially as you know, family, uh, a father or mother listening in, it's so important. Sure. What are your thoughts about the dangers of art artificial intelligence? Yeah, and it's interesting because in book four, which we're launching in October, uh, Britfield and the Eastern Empire starts in Vienna, ends in Russia, and we include 11 countries in book four. One of the major themes is, is quantum computers, quantum encryption, and then the dangers of AI. And so um, I'm not really a big AI proponent um, or, or cheerleader, if you will, at all. Um, there's that. It's been, and AI has been around for, for decades, really, aspects of it. But there's sure. this hardcore push, and the people that are really pushing it are the usual suspects because they want transhumanism. They want the human body incorporated into the computer, and they want the sort of group think and all of that other stuff that goes with it. They can't wait to get a chip jammed into your, into your palm because, oh, my gosh, taking a credit card or money is so bothersome. Well, it, well and, let's, and, pause there. <laughs> let's pause there for a second. A yeah. lot came out right there. So, you know, transhumanism, that's happening right now. Elon Musk, Neuralink is, sure. uh, you know, putting in, right? Always in the beginning of these things, it's for good things, medical things. And, you know, it There's is no helping it. people. It helping people. He yeah. just came out with, they're going to be able to turn, people that are blind are going to be able to see. You know, because of Neuralink, they just passed something in the FDA that, you know, through we'll Elon see. Musk, the potentiality of that. So, so, but I agree with you. It always ends up going to the extreme of control and authoritarian control and, you know, controlling some pe people to have things and some people not based on if you agree with me or not. That's kind of where it ends up, right? Yeah, it is. But it's, I, I just, I, I'll be on the devil's advocate negative side of it because I just think there's so very little good about any of the technology. I love it. Aspect. Go for it. Yes. Yeah. But, you know, and all the medical stuff and it's going to do this and it's, it's like yep. it's so full of crap. Yep. Number one, the entire medical industry is a, is a catastrophic failure. It's nothing more than legalized, Agreed. you know, drug selling and unnecessary operations. When's the last time you went to your doctor and said, you know, here's a really good nutritional diet that you should get on and here's some natural <laughs> supplements? Never unless you have a great doctor. And that's about what, three to 5% of the entire doctors out there? I mean, that's yeah, a whole joke. So, so this, I'm saying that because you mentioned like, that's what they'll say. It's like, oh, they get these things and they can shoot them into your system and find out and it goes to your bloodstream. It's all crap, you know what I mean? It's just, nothing's complex about the human body. It's amazingly designed by God, but it has been the same as it was from the very beginning, frankly. You know, the only, the only problems that's happened now is with all these new diseases is because of all the crap and chemicals that they're putting into you and putting into the system. And, and you know, so that just goes into the whole other thing. So there's always that idea, it's, it's good for you or it's gonna help you or it speeds things up. We don't need anything for speed it up you know we really need to stop take a breath have more time like you said with your family go to the park walk the beach have you know just connect and we don't need to be working 60 70 hours a week we need to be spending more time with the family and so yeah. i say all this to say all of it is all part of the same cabal the same nonsense the same lie makes your life better it's gonna i mean you know i'll grant you like if, if they can actually make blind people see 
that's huge, you know, tiny percent of the entire market, you know, and, and so that'll be their sort of thing. It's like, well, it does this and it does this and it does that. That's not their goal. Social media, right. just as an example, was never designed for you. It was never designed to make you happy or to make your yeah. life more efficient or to connect you with friends and family. It was, yeah. it was to, number one, collect all your information. Not, you know, number two, uh, to dissatisfy you. You know, it's, oh my gosh, look at, my, look at the new house my friend got. You know, suddenly my house isn't good. They, they always said the fastest way to depreciate your car is to compare it to your, your neighbor's new car. You know what I yeah. mean? And suddenly your life isn't so great anymore and your family isn't so great and your kid isn't doing so good. And it's all, this, it, it's all nonsense. You know, and it's all big theater. It's a big show. And it was never designed, you know, like Twitter, you know, like it, 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 it wasn't designed to be efficient in communicating. It was to make you an idiot in communicating, you know, with symbols and 140 letters. It, yeah, you know what I mean? It, that's why kids can't spell anymore. They can't even spell their name. They can't write sentences. It was designed that way. And so I don't mean to go on this tantrum, but it's just like you have to understand those the idiots that are out there, the usual suspects. I call them parasites. Yeah. You know, don't have humanity or God on their mind. They hate God, they hate humanity, and they hate the family. And so right. an AI is all part of that. What's it going to do? What's the efficiency? I can tell you what AI is going to do in technology. It's going to put, you know, in the next five to seven years, 90% of accountants will be out of work. In the next yeah. five to seven years, 40 to 50% of all doctors and nurses will be out of work because of technology and computers. Wow. Um, 40 to 50% of lawyers say goodbye to your job, and then, you know, the laundry list of everything else. The one thing that, that AI will never do, cannot do, is replace creativity. Hey, gents, maybe this fits you, maybe it doesn't. But one thing is true. Misapplied ambition is costly, and a thriving family is priceless. Let me ask you, are you successful? Yet feeling a growing defeat inside, perhaps a deep yearning for more, for what really matters? At what point in the journey did we decide to make silent agreements to put aside what matters most? Perhaps it's the old myth of once I accomplish this, then I'll focus on my callings. Then I'll focus on my family and my faith. Well, too many men have traded real excellence for the deceiving picture culture pressures them to pursue. It's actually possible to have it all, but it must be redefined if you want real excellence. See, you have to be willing to stand against the wind of mediocrity pressing against you that most call normal. A mediocrity usually embraced by Christian circles around you too. See, almost all successful Christian men have found themselves suffocating from their own reality, even when many around them are calling them blessed. There is no success at the sacrifice of your faith, family, and callings in your life. So if you're interested in finding out how we can work together, if you want help, if you're serious about growth, Go to ResoluteMan.com and schedule a call. And so you're seeing stuff where you're saying, oh, no, no, it's creating art. It's creating, no, it's not, it's plagiarizing art. It doesn't yeah. have the creative ability that is given by God to all of us. We're all born creative, but the system has killed that creativity, taken it out of us, you know. Don't do art, you're not going to be an artist. Don't do mu music, you're not going to do a musician. Terrible advice. We've been in a yeah. creativity crisis for over 40 years. However, creativity is the number one most important skill set in the world. You want to know the most three important skills in the world right now based on all kinds of research? Creativity, communication, and storytelling. I it's love not, that. It's not, it's not technology. It's not engineering. All, most engineering's already been offshored. So these guys are out there getting their engineering degrees and stuff. You know, it's already been offshored. And in five years, replaced. So, you, so you're going you're gonna to have a degree in, in worthlessness. What are you going to do? You can't even tie your shoelaces. But with creativity, you can think. You can think outside the box. Creativity is behind entrepreneurship, invention, yes. um, everything. Creativity is in everything, behind everything. And AI is not creative, never will be creative. Um, so it's writing, it's writing, you know, papers and stuff. It's so not writing know, papers. So, yeah. so I 100% agree with you on this. And yeah. as a dad, it's important to rethink about education of your kids, like academics and these things. Yeah, you got to have some of those basics still. But at the same time, you've got, if you're really preparing them for uncertain times, you're teaching resiliency. And that comes through creativity, right? If you're just, if you're just being a robot and, and learning something, you know, normal knowledge, that's one thing. But if you're able to think on the spot, if you're able to speak sure. or a, if you're able to write, I still writing. Well, AI can write. Well, yeah, but if you don't keep, if you don't write creatively, you're going to lose that skill. Think about how many people are going to lose the skill of just basic writing because they have chat GTP and the other tools and the future tools doing it for them. Like what is writing actually going to be like in the future if everybody's having robots do it for them? And writing is communicating. And right. how well you write is how well you communicate. And so guess what? It's going to take away your communication skills. 
Hi, Bob. Well, How it. are you doing <laughs> today? Literally. I mean, they just they want to turn you into a, a brainless robot. You know, hey, and then again, that ties into transhumanism. I mean, all this stuff is connected. Everything we're talking about right now, there is no one yeah. subject. We're talking about transhumanism and AI and um, digital currency and all this all connected. All well, part it's all of the connected. Same. I want to connect something. Hang on yeah. just a second. So we'll get to creativity more because I want to talk more sure. about that. But first, I want to back up a second because there was something really important you talked about, which is all these jobs being replaced by AI. Well, this is why they need to create a populace that believes in socialism. They believe sure. because robots are going to take sure. over a high majority of jobs that it will be necessary for thousands of dollars to be given to every single person on a monthly basis because there won't be enough jobs for everybody in the populace and things will be so efficient, robots will be doing so many things that there's enough abundance and wealth that can be spread around. But you know, as always, their theories, their plans never work out according yeah. to their plan and it always leads to control, authoritarian control. So now you can see, okay, this is all tied together as you're talking about, but it leads to socialism. That's, that's a great tie-in, you know, and, and uh, communism has never worked, it's demonic. And it is a godless society. And, um, and, and it's interesting, too. And I, I traveled a lot. And I just remember being in Eastern Europe. And I just had this conversation the other day. But I was in Budapest. And um, I hired a driver, older gentleman, to drive me. You know, I always would hire a car for like four or five hours just to drive me around first, investigate everything. And I think he was like in his 60s and stuff. And this was a while ago. And I said, what was it like living here under communism? And he said, he said number one, he said it was awful. And he said, um, he said uh, no one had the motivation to work or to do better or to excel because it didn't matter. And so if you both got there at 7 a.m. every morning or 8 a.m., one guy's working his tail off and doing everything correctly and the guy's sitting on his behind just getting by, guess what? They both get the same paycheck. And pretty soon it's just like, what's the point? That's what it yeah. does. It kills communism, which is really, socialism is, is communism light. You know what I mean? Yeah. Let's just call it what it is. It's communism. Yeah. Yeah. And what it does is it kills the human spirit, kills the will to live, kills creativity, kills, the, kills everything. And so it makes you a lazy nothing with no creation. I mean, it's funny, too, not to criticize China, 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 Russia, Russia, Russia. But but China is a communistic state and, and it's not creative. And they're they're a paper tiger, too. I like to say the big hot air balloon. They're, they're two beats away from complete and total bankruptcy. Yeah, and that's true. a whole that's a whole nother story. But because yeah. of communism, there's no creativity, which is why they steal everything. They steal, steal technology, everything. military. Uh, 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 Silicon Valley, all of it. They steal it because they can't invent it because they've killed creativity, and they don't they don't Im, they don't um, foster that in the in the schools. Well, let's get back to creativity, communication. What was the third one? Oh, uh, storytelling. Isn't that interesting? Story. I storytelling. found that out myself. I'm I myself am continuing my education and and um, part of a sort of a PhD program and uh in, in innovation and creativity but one of my assignments and i was doing this um with my professor which is really cool i always like to do the independent studies kind of get out of the classroom and stuff and one of them was to interview someone that worked for disney for 26 years that was fascinating and we wrote we actually wrote and got published a um sort of a harvard business case study based on it every all the names were changed and stuff but the other assignment was to um um take some of our alum, very successful alum, you know, kind of all over the nation, world or whatever. And I think I interviewed about 30 of them from every walk of life you could imagine. And, um, and I, was, I had three, you know, I was asking them questions and stuff, trying to figure out what was the most important skill sets, what makes, you know, business efficient. And um, number one was create, and I didn't lead with anything, but the number one most important skill that they wanted from someone was creativity. Isn't that interesting? And then um, communication came out of that too. And then it was storytelling. And I just thought, isn't that fascinating? But if you think about it, and so when I was doing, just a real quick backtrack, when I launched book one, Britfield Lost Crown, in August 2019, I started a nine, I started a, a, a massive national school tour. I drove 9,000 miles, I visited 23 states, presented over 200 schools in front of more than 40 to 50,000 students. And again, great way to sort of market the book, launch the product, but I was really doing research, deep research. And I was curious about our you know, the United States. I was curious about uh, our educational system. I, want, I wanted I talked to hundreds of librarians and hundreds of teachers and thousands and thousands and thousands of students. What do you read? How often do you read? What do you like? What are you studying? And so it's just like you want to talk to someone that knows it, you know. So um, so I was out there and I, and I was in the trenches of it. But um, and so I kind of incorporated creativity into our presentations to the schools. But I would talk about storytelling. 
And it makes sense because if you think about it, everything we do is storytelling. So right now I'm telling you a story. If you're telling me your background, that's a story. Um, whatever field that you're in, if you're a doctor and you're, and you're with your patients, you're telling a story. Uh, Mrs. Johnson, this is you know what we found out with the results. These are some of the options. Now, how effective you are in your storytelling is the difference between failure or success. Isn't that true? Your resume mm -hmm. is a story. So on that one piece of paper or two pieces of paper, how well you articulate your story is the difference about getting that job. When you're interviewed, you're telling the story to the person that, that's interviewing you for a job that's probably got 100 to 500 applicants. So how effective you are. At, you know, so, so where did you grow up? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, so I actually grew up in so-and-so and I really learned a lot. You know what I mean? And So everything you do, like marketing is a given. Marketing never stops for a company. Marketing is telling a story. And when you're done telling that story, it's the next chapter in that story. And so storytelling is in everything we do. We're communicating a uh, weekend that we had with our friends to communicating to um, presenting an idea that you want funded about your company. Why are we mm -hmm. going to invest a million dollars in you? Mm -hmm. This is why. This is the why. This is my story. You know, so it's interesting. I didn't you know, I wanted to kind of articulate it, but it's like it does make sense if you think about it, because everything yeah. else is just sort of secondary, you know, fills in the piece. Oh, the it's important in its framework of society, the mathematics, the engineering, all the other stuff yeah. that's involved. But yeah. So, so what we're talking about is the three things that are most important that AI can't take over and that humans need to get really, really good at in these unprecedented times. And you're saying it's creativity, communication, and storytelling. Those all seem to cross over. Like you just talked about storytelling, but what, how would you then, ch you know, tell us about communication and, and, and elaborate on that a little bit. I might have a great story to tell, but I'm not a good communicator, right? What about that? You know, and I, and I'm fortunate. I mean, when I, when I got in to what I'm doing now, cause I've done lectures and, and lots of interviews and presentations all over the nation and eventually the world. But, um, uh, I remember when, like when I was in fifth or sixth grade, I, I'd take a D before getting up in front of the class, but I knew that was going to be a problem. And I got into Toastmasters and, mm -hmm. and finally cracked that nut, if you will, and went on and got multiple certificates and stuff. And it's always a learning process, but a lot of authors, if you will, are great storytellers, but not good communicators. You get them on an yes. interview and you're like, whoa, you know, whoa. <laughs> uh, so there's a great, there's a, you know, they're all important and they all need to be moving forward. But it's just like, even with the communication, let's take it down a notch. How many things have, how many relationships have failed because of poor communication? Ouch. Yeah. Let's dig deep right now, right? Yeah. It's the things that weren't said or brought up, you know, and suddenly it just festers and it turns into some big explosion and now, boom, you got a huge divorce rate or yeah. whatever it is, you know, or at your job, you know what I mean? And um, and I try to, I I try really good to be a good communicator. It's it's hard if, you know, it's like, it's like if something's late, you know what I mean? You don't, you're like, you're, you, you put, I'm just, I'm, I quickly, I just send somebody an email or whatever, a text and say, look, not gonna have it until tomorrow. Or, you know, it's gonna be a couple more days. Um, so that's a, that's a form of communication. That's effective communication, staying in touch with everybody, following up with everybody. Those are modes of communication. Everyone is so busy today, but very few people are productive. Isn't that the truth? I'm, so busy. I'm so busy right now, but you're not, you're not really busy. You're just disorganized and you're unproductive. And we are, we are dealing with a society right now that yeah. frankly, nobody wants to work. Let's be honest. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think it tough. takes courage to be a good communicator, especially today. It takes courage because it does. you only have free speech if you're willing to actually say what <laughs> needs to be said and what's important to sure. say and have the motivation to follow through and make sure it's said and communicate with people and follow up. And so a lot of it is character too. good communication, as you're talking about, is is having good character that I always follow up with people. I always get back to people. That's sure. part of good communication. And so I think people listening in, are you a good communicator? It doesn't mean you have to be a professional speaker on stage no. mean to be, you don't need to be but like your pastor but are you having the character to follow through are you having to, the courage to say what you need to your wife are you doing these things in real time versus letting it build up and blow up eventually so good communication i love that how you talked about that and then the first one was creativity and so why don't you share about that yeah, and creativity is in, in everything, and it's, it's, it's really a way of thinking. And let me give an example of um, one of my favorite exercises that I've done in classrooms, and it's actually where we write a, um, a script. We write a story. And uh, so I'll come into the classroom. might be 30, um, you know, middle schoolers or whatever. i got about an hour, and I say, um, okay, so Paramount Pictures has just given us $50 million to make a movie. What are we going to do? And so I break them up in groups of four to five, which is great. I, um, um, they pick a team, team leader for each group. So now there's a leadership role. 
And I go, you got 15 minutes to come up with an idea or concept for a story, for a movie. It could be an action adventure, drama, romantic comedy. And then so they start brainstorming among, among themselves. I go around each table, sort of fuel it. And, and oh, what do you think I was thinking about? Okay, that's kind of cool. And then we finish that up. And then we, um, when we're done, about 15 minutes or something, th the leader stands up, pitches their idea. Each one hears it. We vote on it as a class. And then we start writing. And, um, and then we, and we work it on the three act structure and I say, okay, great. So where's, we pick, you know, it's going to an action adventure or something. Where's it going to, where's it going to take place? Okay. Why is it going to take place right there? Okay, great. So what time of the year is it? Because it's very different if it's in winter versus summer. Okay. And our, our main character, you know, who are they? How old are they? And so I do this exercise for an hour and guess what? I'm, f I'm, I'm firing up in these kids and fostering creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. They will learn more from that one class on how to think, how to communicate those thoughts, how to approach things from multiple different angles. And so I'm kind of using that as an example of creativity. Um, I'll give you another example of creativity. A lot of the high tech firms in Silicon Valley are hiring applicants with a musical background, five to one to 10 to one, because mm -hmm. they know for a fact, and they don't necessarily answer it. Do you play a musical instrument on the, on the resume? But they look for it. And they know that if someone plays a musical instrument and can read music, they tend to be better managers, better under crisis, better brainstormers, can shift when things change and have a better creative capacity for dealing with issues and problems. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. From just playing mm -hmm. the trumpet or the mm -hmm. flute or the violin. Mm -hmm. And music is one of those aspects of creativity. You know, just because uh, you want to paint doesn't mean you're going to be a famous painter, but it's it's how your mind works. When you're in a creative mode, you're, you're, you're firing your synapses in a very different way. Um, a very exciting way, a very stimulating way. Um, being creative helps with depression and it stimulates the mind. It's the type of thing when you're in a zone and you think 10 minutes has gone by and it's like three hours has gone by. So creativity does all these wonderful things, which is what they know and which is why they've been killing creativity. And there's a great 2006 TED Talk by Sir Ken Robinson, someone you've mm -hmm. probably never heard of, mm -hmm. called Our Schools Killing Creativity. 18-minute TED Talk, knocks it out of the park. It's the number one most downloaded and watched TED Talk in their history. Ask yourself why. But they've been doing this for years and decades, killing creativity and getting it out of the classroom. Let's get rid of the arts. Cut those. Because the arts don't have anything to do with anything. Huge bad advice. The new, the new MBA now is the MFA. Uh, and we are actually in a creative renaissance right now. Creativity is coming back with a vengeance. It's so cool. It's so cool. Well, hey, uh, two things. The first thing is just curious, you know, uh, what's behind the curtain at, with Russia? You know, what are your thoughts on Russia and what's going on? Uh, I, I've been over there. I've studied Russia um, quite a bit. And um, I, I, I like Russia, Russia. I'm not concerned about Russia. I think if mainstream media is making them the villain, then then you know that it's the opposite is the truth. Mm -hmm. um, I know that they've out, outlawed um, pornography. Hmm. Interesting. I know that they've outlawed GMO. Uh, so, so putting poison in, in chemicals in your food, they outlawed that. Interesting. Big supporter of Christianity and churches. Huh. Interesting. Uh, they don't have a cabal run um, banking system built on fake paper and, or, or, or built on paper and, and fake air. Um, interesting. Hmm. Gee, why? Russia, 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 Russia. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, I think it's, um, I don't think, I think, I think it's a good country. I think most of the stuff you've heard is bunk and lies. No one's perfect and no leader's perfect, but, um, yeah, it doesn't seem like, uh, yeah. you know, Russia has motivation to take over all the NATO countries or anything. No. And, and this whole nuclear nonsense, stop it, please. You know, all that is, is just peddling fear. So. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Hey, I always like to end with, uh, someone sharing a time they rejected passivity as a man and it made a meaningful difference. I'd love to hear yours. Define it. How would you define it? What do you mean? Yeah, you know, so the Garden of Eden, you know, there, Adam uh, was passive as he watched Eve, mm. you know, be deceived and then participated in it. And then it got even worse afterwards, actually. Then he <laughs> uh, blamed the women and then, and then it even got worse. And then he's hiding from God. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that was the, he's, he's the epitome right in the beginning there of passivity that thou because sin entered the world we all we all tend to have that sometimes as men i mean we could sure. be courageous out writing books doing sports doing whatever we're passionate and good at and then walk in the door of our house and be passive with our family yeah um, so awesome. you know you know just some kind of story where you've rejected that and it made a difference yeah um i think i think i think a lot in my life um has been that sort of mindset um 
but you know, all glory to God in that sense. And uh, yeah. really having the Bible as the word of God and knowing how to follow that, if that makes sense, and taking it to heart and taking it as fact. And so what I'm saying is, is that's my, 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 my guideline. We walk by faith, not by sight. That's a tough yeah. one. But, and I struggle with that. I struggle, I was struggling with it this morning, <laughs> you know, a little teed off. Yeah. But um, have to, you know what I mean? And so um, I think it, I think it, in, in, I think boldness, you know, we weren't given the spirit of fear. I love this. We weren't given the spirit of fear, but of love, strength, and sound mind. And another definition of, of strength is boldness. And I love yeah. that and, um, and having that boldness. So I think it's, it's been, for me, it's been huge because it's been this whole Britfield undertaking. This is massive. And it's like, I mean, we're up against, you can't imagine. And, uh, but I don't look at it that way and I don't see it that way. And um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't look up at it, I look down at it, right? All, all the infrastructure and the billion do- billions of dollars and these six industries that are ped- peddling their crap, that's way down in the gutter. I don't spend time looking down there. Yeah. So um, I think we've all been called to something extraordinary, if not many things. I think we're all gifted and we have extraordinary gifts. We're unique. There's a reason for us to be here in this time right now, fact. And, um, and it's exciting. And so I think we need to stop being distracted with a bunch of crap and nonsense and um, you know, just everything, you know, over here, over here, look over here. And so stay focused. You've all, we all have a calling. What has God called you to do that? And don't let anything interrupt you from doing that. And it's, um, if we, I don't know if we'd have time, but in a nutshell of 60 seconds, but I mean, one of the greatest examples of, of, of getting, dis, of getting the, the importance of being distracted was if you're ever familiar with um, Shackleton's, you know, adventure mm-hmm. and how he's trying to, you know, there wasn't very many things to do to, to accomplish anymore. And so he was headed down to, um, um, not very, oh, the South, South Pole, and he wanted to be the farthest to cross the South Pole inland. No one's ever done that. And it was a disastrous trip. And, um, and, they, and they got stuck in the ice and this, like, the ship like literally got crushed. <laughs> They're sitting here in the middle of nowhere. And so it was really cool because he made, he, at that moment, he made this decision. And he goes, it was no longer about victory or triumph. It was getting every single man home alive. And he did. But um, there's a quick story where they ended up on this thing called Elephant Island. And it's like this little volcanic outcrop in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Ocean. And their only hope was to take a couple of their basic rowboats, survival boats, um, and put them together. And with five men, somehow traveled the Pacific Ocean for 800 miles to get over to South Georgia Island, where there was a, a station. 800 miles. And they had the, um, the, the guy that did the navigation, and it's like at night, you know, it's like, and he's sitting there with his, his instruments, and he's looking at the stars. And they said if, he, if they were off by um, a half a degree, they would have missed the island by miles and have died at sea. And mm. it always stuck with me, that half a degree. Mm. And how, how clever is the devil, if you will? Just a little bit, get you distracted. Just a little bit, get you thinking over here. Get you all bunged up with this. Get you all frustrated with this. And that's how mm. he works. And he's a master at distraction. Mm. And it doesn't take more than a half a degree to miss your mark by miles. And so I say that to say, mm. stay focused. Stay mm. focused on your calling. Let nothing interrupt it. Let no one stop it. What God has made, nothing will will, will, will will destroy, and that's a fact. So God's called you oh. to it. And I'll tell you something. It'll be the hardest yeah. thing you've ever done. It'll take you 10 times longer, but it will be right. So good, so good. Hey, where can people find the, the upcoming next book and the three books that are already out? Sure. Uh, the best place to purchase if you want signed copies is the Britfield.com website, which is really cool. It's an award-winning website. We have over 400 pictures on there of England interactive maps, tons of information, other interviews, all our products, or Amazon, or any of the other main main places to, uh, to purchase the series. They're great gifts. They're great for kids. They're great for adults. They're great for everyone. Everyone just really enjoys the series, and it's fun. And I was really trying to bring back that wonderment of childhood and the fun of being a kid and the adventure that we all sort of experienced when we were younger. So... Well, we need more good works like that. We so appreciate you putting those out. And uh, thanks for being on the show. Sure. Yeah, it was a privilege.